And next we have Greg Muth, who is the founding president of the New England chapter for the International Institute for Sustainable Laboratories. And our stakeholders in higher and healthcare thought this was a really important constituency to bring in um, for this proposed collaborative partnership regionally. Thank you. Um, so our next speaker is gonna be Phil Wardzek, who is the, the executive director and founding president of the National I2SL organization, the International Institute for Sustainable Laboratories. Um, so a lot of you probably know the I2SL as Labs 21. Um, the, the EPA and the Department of Energy funded the Labs 21 program back in the early 90s, or late 90s rather, sorry. Um, and in 2005, the I2SL organization was founded as a nonprofit organization alongside uh, the Lab 21 program. Over time, the EPA and the DOE have stepped back and let the I2SL take more responsibility. Until last year, um, I2SL has taken over complete responsibility for these programs. Um, so who is I2SL, or formerly Labs 21? We're a group of professionals committed to advancing research in um, science and medicine um, by advancing sustainable strategies for high-tech facilities. Um, last year, um, as the I2SL took over from uh, the government, um, it was really a very transformative time for the organization. They've transformed from an organization where the government was providing data to lab users, facility operators, and the lab design community, and now they've transformed to an organization where that lab design community now owns that data. Um, we've gone from consumers of data to the generators and the owners of data. So in order to get more participation, the organization has reached out and formed local chapters. So this is the opportunity for um, this community to uh, participate. You know, it's our opportunity to participate more frequently, to participate locally, and hopefully to participate more meaningfully. So um, I invite you all to get involved in this chapter. If you're an individual, become a member. If you're an organization or institution, become a sponsor. Um, if you have a space that we can use for an event, become a host. But whatever you do, please get involved. Um, I will be uh, here at the break, so if you're interested in getting involved, come see me, or we will have uh, sign-up sheets outside where you can give us your name and your email address and someone will contact you. So, um, as I said, our next speaker is Phil Wardzek. Phil is, as I said, um, the executive director and founding president of I2SL. Um, before founding I2SL, he spent 27 years in the EPA. Um, you know, among other responsibilities there, he actually conceived of the Labs 21 program, um, developed it, administered it, you know, and took it from really just a conceptual idea to what it is today. Uh, he's in a, uh, been experienced in the areas of environmental risk assessment, industrial microbiology, wastewater systems, and uh, energy and efficiency and sustainable policy. He is the chairman of the Carnegie Mellon Center for Advanced Building Systems and Integration and Diagnostics, an adjunct faculty for the Sea Grant Institute at University of Hawaii, Manoa. Nice gig. Um, and he's won numerous awards for both his role at the EPA and for his role with I2SL. So please welcome Phil Wurdzak. Well, that was way too deserving. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Um, it's been 15 years since I've been uh, on the Harvard campus. Uh, for those of you that uh, might have been here 15 years ago, uh, EPA started Labs 21 here. Um, there was a uh, public meeting held, I don't know which building it was, and we invited a number of uh, folks to come in uh, as an agency uh, with the Department of Energy and, and basically asked the question, is this worthwhile doing? Is this something that the government should do? And of course the question was yes, and that sent us off on a crazy ride. So what I wanna, let's see, how does this work? 
Hey, there we go. I don't know how that happened, but there it is. So I'm going to talk about walking with owners. This is kind of building on what you just heard from Wendell and what you'll hear from his group later on today. Um, so let me, let me kind of go through this. A little unconventional presentation for you all, as you'll see. Uh, what I'm trying to get across is, uh, is a little, is building on what Wendell said, but uh, a little bit further. So uh, just real brief, this is what I2SL is all about. Um, we promote sustainability in labs and other high-tech facilities. It was a program of EPA and DOE, as you heard. Our vision is really to engage a global network. What you just heard uh, from Greg is um, that with that change, a number of people are starting to take, uh, take the, uh, the reins, thank God, and, and running with this program locally. And so we accommodate, uh, we, we congratulate Greg and several others. In fact, there's now a chapter in Chicago, one in Denver. Uh, we're about ready to have one in DC, Philadelphia. Uh, Kansas City just joined up, Seattle's coming next. Mumbai, India is in the development phase, as is Singapore. And we have partners in Europe. So this is really developing our global network to, to really share the kind of things that you heard from the University of California, sort of things that you're doing here. And, and we do this through education. That's really our mission. Uh, so what I want to go through here is the idea of management. <laughs> we talk about energy, but we don't necessarily talk about management. And I'm meaning management beyond energy. Uh, we also need to think about behaviors. Who's all involved in this? And I'm going to present an idea about living on the edge. And I'll, you'll see what that is. I really wanted to play a song from Bon Jovi, but I uh, decided not to do that. But there was something on living on the edge from him. Um, but uh, I'm going to use music, nonetheless, as a comparison to try to help you understand what I'm, what I'm after and in a way of standardizing communication finding the stakeholders and measuring results. So a little bit about uh, management realities here. Um, all of these things you're, you're very much aware of. These, these buildings, laboratories, as was shown in, in prior presentations, are, are very energy intensive. They're very resource intensive. Um, we've seen this not just with energy. We see it with water. We see it with money. We see it with so many people. Uh, it, it's, it's an extraordinary facility that when it's built, it's going to cost you, and it's going to cost you for a long time, and four to six, air ch or four to six times the, 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 the energy consumption of, of, of an office building. Uh, that might be the lower end. We, we've seen labs 20, 30, 40, and more percent uh, higher. They're costly to build, and I want to concentrate here in this presentation on operation and maintenance, because maintenance now involves everybody in that building, not just the maintenance people, but everybody, and I'm going to talk to that. We involve uh, more regulatory oversight, health and safety, you've heard that, hazardous materials, chemical management, all kinds of things that, that can go on in these facilities, and they are as diverse as you can think they are. And as science continues to advance and as research continues to advance, as health solutions continue to advance, there's always going to be a challenge with these kinds of facilities. They're 24-hour operation, and they're seven days a week, and they're all year long. And that was pointed out. They contain all of this equipment that is uh, specialized. It has its its own unique uh, requirements for resources. Um, and as I say, continually influenced, uh, these buildings are continually influenced by the evolving technology and the people that are using them to advance their research and their science. So a little bit on a, uh, the roadmap here. Uh, the idea is that, uh, uh, first of all, when Labs 21 started, we recognize that these buildings are not spec buildings, for the most part. Now, you can get into some that are, that, that are startup firms where, where a company will come in and, and occupy space for some period of time, and they lease that space. But for the most part, you're building for a long time, and you're going to have that building for a long time. So they're designed and engineered, frankly, to bring in the best people you can and to keep those that you already got. Okay, So you're competing, especially universities. And, in pharmaceuticals, they're all competing to try to get the best person, so they want to have the best facilities to do that. They're flexible, they're dynamic, and all of this requires, uh, will, will influence that building over the perform uh, its performance over the life cycle, over the use of that building for that many years. So to address the complexities of these and other buildings, performance demands information, okay? And I'm, I'm going to talk about the performance here in a second. To ensure that performance, 
and to guide behavior. And the behavior is everyone involved again in that building. So here's where it gets off track. <laughs> Unlike automobiles, buildings have many hands-on drivers. Coming back to who's all in that building and can influence that building. We just talked about researchers. Talked about all kinds of folks in that building that are driving that building's performance. There's no shared guidance. There's no user manual or the, a shared dashboard. Now, Wendell talked about the idea of bringing back information uh, to, uh, to the user. We're just starting to see that, and we want to promote that. Nevertheless, in our everyday life, we see this sort of thing, right? We're getting signals all the time. We go to the doctor to get a signal. I got to lose weight. So what's he tell you? Well, you got to go start looking at, you know, on, on, on the panel of the food that you're buying, make some decisions about your life. So we're seeing this in everyday life. We don't see this in buildings. We see this in a car. We, had a, you know, we get a dashboard, gives us some idea of how we're performing with that facility. And in fact, oftentimes, we have somebody in the seat beside us also telling us what to do, maybe even in the back seat. But in a building, this is what you see, and there's only a couple of people that actually see that. So that particular dashboard on the lower right-hand side is seen by maybe a couple of folks. But the rest of the, plate, the, rest of the drivers don't have a chance to see it, okay? There's not even somebody in the back seat yelling, turn here, okay? So we have to train for behavior. I mean, somebody gave Moses a, a bunch of uh, rules on how people should live together. And well, this has been around for a long time. On the right-hand side of that, before you can even begin to drive, you have to understand this stuff. It is very complicated. And yet we're able to drive a vehicle, a piece of technology, and we even put people in these things. Sometimes we even have buses. And we run into very complex situations like the car is faced with in the bottom left uh, side. So we go through a lot to convey information, not just at the beginning of the process, but throughout the use of that technology, in this case a car. On the lower right-hand corner is what we see maybe if we're in a building. That happened to be in an elevator. <laughs> so, so very little information is given. However, we do train for an outcome. We see this in many, many ways, where we have given some instruction early on in life so that the, we have an expectation, or at least we hope there's a, 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 we're driving a performance, we're driving an outcome. Whether that child ever becomes a professional baseball player, we don't know. But the idea is we begin training early. Here's an example of that, okay? Now, the authority having jurisdiction in this case happens to be the parent. And the parent takes every precaution to make sure that they control a function, <laughs> okay? Now, this user happens to be not knowing where he's going and doesn't necessarily represent a lab person, but not far from it. <laughs> Soon after that piece of equipment is taken off of that child, we, we introduce them to this idea, okay? Again, we're training. We're moving them along on one function only, but we're training them. When you see this, that's what it's for, and this is what you think about, and then all of a sudden you know what to do with it. Next one is, as they get a little older, they start making distinctions. Oh, there's one for women, and there's one for men. And oh, there's a wall between it, so I don't go into the same place they're going, right? So we're giving these signals throughout the life of that child, bringing them to a point where we can manage what's going on by a whole bunch of these people, okay? In this case, wastewater treatment plant, we're cleaning up the mess, the function of every one of us. And then we dump it into the water to the left, it goes downstream after it's been treated, somebody draws it in through a water treatment plant, and we're drinking it again. <laughs> Unusual stuff here, but this is what's going on. Buildings, okay? These are just a couple of random things that I picked up off the website. Um, we don't have much in the way of signals here. We, we occupy these buildings, but we don't really have an idea of how to occupy them. So in a way, when we build them or retrofit them, we really are only stuck with a little bit of information, like how many people can get on the elevator, or how many people can go in a room, or how to flush the toilet. So we build and we deliver a facility 
and we hand it off to the owner, and the owner is clueless. Facility staff is clueless. They get a building, they get a bunch of, they might get a, a pallet or two in plastic wrap of all of the things that they need to know about that building, but it's, it may not even be up to date. It's not as built, it may not even have all the information they need, and clearly it's coming in a form that they can't use. And so we bring these people to the edge and we go, we wave goodbye, okay? So there's no continuation of what was just designed, what was built, and how to get further along. So our, our issue is communication. We're not communicating, although we do this in other ways, we don't communicate in, in buildings. So we need to communicate for these points, to understand, to be efficient, to standardize consistency, comprehensive, and to influence. This is uh, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. It's a Mozart song, it's from the 1750s, and yet this is still being played today, and people know how to play it. There's a bunch playing it. And, and there's order there. there there's, there's information, there's behavior, everything's going on right here, and they're all playing that simple little song. And even this bunch could play it, okay? So the idea is you're communicating something that's quite simple, and you have a, a basic communication item that's making that happen. And everybody can play from that same sheet of music. Even this, okay? Everybody knows their point, they know their play, they know their instrument, they know how, what the song is, and they all get together and they make music. And what I'm trying to do here is, is point out that they are trained and responsible for the product that they're producing and for the product that they're providing to others. I'm trying to draw this parallel to buildings. The group on the right could probably play the building on the left. The group on the left on the bottom could probably play the building on the right. The point to make here is that the complexities have grown and we have more people involved in trying to make these, these facilities actually be, get built and to actually work. And it's not only on the outside, it's what's going on on the inside. And we know on the top left the complexities of these facilities and that's not even hardly what we see in most cases. Bottom right is an office building. They too have some complexities, but there's no signal to those people as well. And then we start to get into major influences. And this again gets to the point where you have other things going on and you have an authority having jurisdiction that might be your health and safety officer, might be somebody else, codes and standards on how that building is operated and nobody really has that information uh, with, what, with, with, with regard to how to operate in the space that they're given. So we need to kind of move on, say goodbye to that old strategy and develop something that starts to embrace everybody in the process. And that's what I think you're hearing from Wendell, and that's the, that's the promotion that we're going after, is to get people to practice, and that's essentially what's going on here. There's no audience, very few. The idea is to get people to practice so that they can begin early in the process of understanding what this building, what this structure, what it's going to do, and what their role is in it. And so you bring all the stakeholders together, even those that are sitting in the, in, in the research booths or in the research uh, position, to actually start to understand what their role is and what their responsibility is. And you come back to that, uh, that, that panel on the side of your box of cornflakes. That's what they need to know. What's my space able to do? When am I out of whack? Now there's some tools coming along called building information modeling, which is used primarily by the design build organizations that are out there, but we're trying to move this with the National Institute of Building Sciences to actually become a, a tool for the, for the operation of that facility. So again, we're coming back to this idea of a standard communication. What is it? Is it this? We believe it is. That gives everybody the same sheet of music on which to perform and do their job. So it will benefit the investor. It will benefit those that are coordinating with that solution and playing that music. And it actually helps the people that are listening. And those people that are listening are your clients. So they're your, they could be the lab people. They could also be the people that you're serving as a result of your research. So we want to get everybody involved in that facility to understand what their role is. Now, to kind of highlight a communication issue here, uh, you see these three guys in the bottom, they happen to be New York Yankees guys, and they can't figure out who's supposed to stay in the field. And he's going back. 
and this is a lack of communication. And they can't, you know, wait, what do I do here, you know? Do I, and, and they're trying to communicate, is it me? Do I walk off? So it's, it's a crazy little story, but it, but it basically shows that we can't communicate very well. And if we can't do it on a ball field, we're not going to do it in a building unless there's some kind of sheet of music in which we're all singing from. So uh, that was really the nature of my presentation, was try to convey the idea that we need to move more towards sharing information about that building's performance, what its capacities are, with the people that are actually using the building, not just with those given the responsibility to maintain it or operate it. Everybody has a, has a role in this. The, 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 uh, uh, the CFO has a role. The IT people have a role. The users have a role. The owner has a role. And, and everybody needs to get in, engaged. Um, and I think that's it for me. Okay.